Today on Mason's Medicinals interview series with Real Mushrooms, we have a very special guest, Dr. Erica Zelfen. Dr. Erica is a licensed family medicine doctor and primary health care provider. In a world of specialization, Dr. Erica has chosen to commit to being multi-passionate and versatile in the way that she helps people. She earned her doctorate in naturopathic medicine at the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon. And she also has a private practice in Portland called Simba Health. She mentored under a pediatrician where she learned more about family practice and pediatrics. And Dr. Erica is also a leader in the psychedelic medicine world, having very good insight and wisdom around harm reduction and informed consent on those who are looking to pursue psychedelic therapies for healing. She takes both a left brain and a right brain approach when exploring this topic. So welcome, Dr. Erica, to the Mason Medicinals Real Mushrooms interview series. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. So to start us off, I'm really curious, and I know some of our viewers will be, but what kind of got you into the whole psychedelic kind of renaissance, psychedelic movement in medicine? Really, it was a matter of need, and it was a matter of it just happened. It was not at all my intention when I went into medicine either to work with psychedelics or to work with mental health, frankly. And it was after I opened my practice that I had all of these patients that I realized, wow, I need more tools in my toolkit, which is really saying a lot even as a naturopathic physician, because naturopathic doctors have a lot of tools in their toolkit. Being a licensed primary care provider in the state of Oregon, I have all the tools that a prescriber has in that state. So I have the whole arsenal of antidepressants, anxiety meds, even the benzodiazepines. I have all those. Plus, I have all of the natural medicine tools, uh, herbs, nutritional support, homeopathy, you name it. And I still felt like I needed more to help people with their mental health, not just with their mental health, but I realized what was missing in mental health and what's missing in mind-body medicine in general is the soul, that I needed something and these patients needed something that was going to help them on a different plane because that different plane affects our mental health or however you want to say it, our mood in this plane. And as it turns out, I can't time travel. I'm not a shaman. I'm a mediocre homeopath. It just happened. Right place at the right time. Opportunities presenting themselves to me with sparks of inspiration guiding my choices. And here we are. That's really cool. So it was like this need of patients and the people that you were in service to, and also just sort of like a personal inclination to find more tools and to help people at a deeper level to heal. Exactly. So looking into this like whole world, it's a, it's a big world and it's very layered. So just in general, what are some of the big psychedelic or common psychedelic-like therapies in terms of the substances that are kind of gaining traction or gaining popularity right now or, or usefulness? There are many. There's a reason that there are so many kinds of medicine, not just in the psychedelic world, but period on this green earth, because different people need different things for different stations in life. That being said, we've seen a big boom in research and a big boom in interest with respect to certain substances. Psilocybin is towards the top of that list. That's the active constituent in magic mushrooms. A lot of research on that one, probably because it has such a great safety profile. Uh, a trip with psilocybin also only lasts four to eight hours, depending on the person. So it's a handy one for conducting research with. Also, it's been shown to help with conditions that are very, very common nowadays, namely depression, anxiety, and certain types of substance use disorders. So there's psilocybin. Another one that I think we are going to see legalized within a matter of years, as in a few years, is MDMA, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, or 3,4-methylene dioxymethamphetamine specifically. That is the active ingredient in the street drug known as ecstasy or molly. In my professional opinion, no substance works better for treating post-traumatic stress disorder than MDMA when paired with therapy. It's also an incredible adjuvant for couples therapy. So individual sessions for healing trauma and then couples therapy sessions as well, whether or not 
one or both members of the couple have lived through a trauma. So we have psilocybin, we have MDMA. Another big one now is ketamine. Ketamine is popular for a few reasons. One, it's legal, so that helps. It's been in use since the 1970s, so we have a good handle on its safety profile, and we know it's got a great safety profile, and it plays well with a lot of prescription medications. Ketamine can be used in a variety of dose ranges, everything from microdosing on a daily basis, taking it like you would an antidepressant, to doing medium doses in the context of therapy to get you more mileage in therapy, to taking a big dose and actually not quite big enough that you lose consciousness because ketamine is an anesthesia drug, but less than an anesthesia dose, you actually have a psychedelic trip on ketamine, which lasts about an hour. So psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine, what else? LSD, of course. LSD has been a little late to the Renaissance because it was so heavily stigmatized in the late 60s and early 70s. To this day, we have mandatory minimum sentencing for LSD manufacturing and distribution. Actually, we have two Americans who in American history have been sentenced to life in prison for manufacturing LSD. And so because LSD is so heavily stigmatized and because an LSD trip can last up to 14 hours, We haven't seen as much research with that molecule, but that's changing as we're getting more traction and acceptance with the other psychedelics. Because as it turns out, LSD is great medicine too. And then DMT. We're seeing a lot of new and interesting work around DMT, which is known as the spirit molecule. And DMT is also one of the active ingredients in the Amazonian brew ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is popular, getting popular again. Pretty much if you meet anyone who works in Silicon Valley, they've probably done ayahuasca. There are ayahuasca circles in every North American city. I read in a magazine somewhere, it's estimated that in North America, there are at least 40 ayahuasca ceremonies per night on the weekends. That one's growing in popularity. And ibogaine is sort of not as frontline, but underground, there's a very strong ibogaine movement that is still alive and is still growing. Ibogaine is a shrub actually comes to us from Africa, Cameroon, and Gabon. Now we have the technology to make a semi-synthetic version of Ibogaine that's more environmentally sustainable. Traditionally, Ibogaine was used for rites of passage, communicating with ancestors and healing. But incidentally, someone in the 1980s by the name of Howard Lotsoff discovered that after he took Ibogaine, he no longer craved heroin, and he was a heroin user. And so now Ibogaine is sort of the psychedelic of choice for various types of substance use disorders, specifically opioid use disorders. And I've worked with it uh, in Mexico in that context as well. So I can speak to its merits and its limitations as well. There are more compounds, but those are, those are kind of the greatest hits and those are what's hot right now. There's also a, a big race and a big patent cash grab happening right now where various Firms and research groups are running and taking out patents on different versions of some of these molecules, different strains of 2CB, different strains of MDMA. And when we don't have actual molecules being patented, people are now patenting different ways of working with these molecules. There's a bit of legitimate rigorous science fueling this movement. And then there's a bit of a race to the top, like we saw with cannabis of uh, people just wanting to make as much money as they can before the bubble bursts. So that's fueling the hype and the hysteria. (laughs) Okay, thanks for giving us an outline of just like the therapeutic compounds and um, medicines available or out there that people are experiencing or seeking out. From your perspective, I mean, you're heavy into this world, you've taken a big interest. What's maybe one or two things you could share from your perspective on something that's grabbed your attention on the uniqueness or maybe the versatility of using some of these things as a harm reduction protocol or an integration protocol, whatever. But what are some of the things in the research world that you've seen that are just like, ah, that's pretty amazing. I'd like to share more about this or learn more. Yeah. So I would really like to harp on psilocybin specifically. Full disclosure, potential conflict of interest. I work and live in the state of Oregon in the United States. I'm Canadian born, but now I I, I live in the States. Oregon is the first state in the United States to decriminalize most drugs and to not just decriminalize, but also legalize psilocybin services. And I am the lead educator in a school that is approved by the Oregon Health Authority to actually train psilocybin facilitators. So there's my potential conflict of interest. 
Now, that being said, I wouldn't have taken this job if I didn't believe that this medicine helps people. And helps people, it certainly does. With psilocybin, it can help with a variety of things. But in general, the research shows or suggests that psilocybin is an excellent molecule for treating depression and anxiety. It works, according to the data, at least as well as antidepressant medications. But what's interesting is while both conventional SSRI, antidepressant medications, and psilocybin both act on serotonin, they do so in different ways and they act on different kinds of serotonin receptors. So what that means is it's not more of the same thing. And also what that means is it may be helpful for a person even if they're on antidepressant medications, to work with psilocybin because they're going to be still getting novel input through a slightly different pathway than their meds are giving them. I know I'm, I'm waving a red cape in front of a bull when I say this, and we need, more res- we need more data. Based on the data we have available, based on the decades over which people have been using psilocybin and reporting their findings, And based on my own observations, I think it's absolutely safe to combine psilocybin with most antidepressant medications. Now, we need more data on that, but I would say of my clients who work with psilocybin, who take psilocybin, half of them are on psych meds. Not only do they tolerate the psilocybin, well, sometimes they need higher doses, but they're able to get a lot of mileage out of their psilocybin treatments as well. That's one that I'm really excited about is the psilocybin. We've also seen a big boom, and I should have said this uh, with your first question, big explosion in microdosing. Microdosing is a bit more controversial because is it the placebo effect? Does it actually do something? I think it actually does something, but some, we have some studies suggesting it, it might actually all be placebo. But what I've seen in my client base, uh, so, you know, by the time people come to see me, if you Google my name, psychedelics is going to pop up somewhere near the top. So by the time people reach out to me, they've already worked with psychedelics or they're seriously considering it. So I get a lot of that information. Those are the people who come to see me. Based on their reports, what I'm hearing is that microdosing does seem to help people with the mood. And also interestingly, that when people microdose, meaning they take very sub-perceptive doses of psilocybin or LSD, that they are less interested in drinking alcohol and in smoking cannabis and in using other substances that may be harmful to them. They just want it less. And I've especially seen this to be the case in women. I've seen it in both males, females, and non-binary individuals. Again, it might just be the population that's attracted to me, but so many women, the moms who after the kids go to bed, they have a glass of wine and it turns into two glasses of wine. And then the next morning, they don't feel good. They seem to do really well with microdosing. And... Why do you think that is? I mean, there's obviously some neurology, maybe, or placebo, like you said, with the microdosing. But um, yeah, from your perspective, what do you think is going on there? I can only guess. Full disclosure, I'm just going to say I can't microdose. I feel horrible when I try to do it. So I'm not, I'm not like a poster child for it. But I think there are a few mechanisms at play there. One is we don't entirely know how microdosing works. We just have theories. And one theory is that we have that activity at the serotonin receptor at the 5-HT2A receptor. Even though it's at minuscule doses, serotonin, even a small change, may affect how we feel and act. It's also proposed that even microdoses of psychedelics are anti-inflammatory. And keep in mind, that's how a lot of our antidepressants work, is they're anti-inflammatories. So, and we may also have growth of new neurons in the brain, especially with continued use of microdosing. Also, I, I really do wanna harp on how harmful alcohol is for mood, for mental health, and for physical health. And I think we've really normalized the consumption of alcohol in our culture. Alcohol is the only drug that if you don't use it, people think you have a problem or there's something odd. Or if you go to a party and you don't have a drink, people think that's strange. That's really the only drug like that in our culture. As socially acceptable as alcohol is, it's actually quite a nefarious substance when you look at the effects that even one drink can have on hydration status, on sleep quality, on rebound anxiety effects. So having one drink, the alcohol hits the GABA receptor and you feel relaxed. Maybe you 
have more fun or you fall asleep easier, as your body metabolizes that alcohol, there's a rebound effect where you're actually going to feel more anxious than before you had that drink. And so this is where, where and how and why we see people that don't necessarily have a problem with alcohol, but they really like to have that one drink every night with dinner. Or they're doing okay with alcohol, but they're finding that they need, to, they need to take something during the day. In the morning, they wake up anxious. They need to take an antidepressant or benzodiazepine or something naturopathic. They need to take their lavender oil or their L-theanine. Yeah, I just wake up in the morning with anxiety. Hmm, did that drink before bed have something to do with it? When we interrupt that cycle, a lot of things shift for a person. And maybe it's the microdosing that's making them feel better, or maybe it's just that they're not having a glass of wine after the kids go to bed that's making them feel better. Maybe it's both. I love this conversation. Skipping a little bit away from that, but I realize there's much more there. What are some important things to consider when someone's thinking about embarking on a psychedelic healing session or a psychedelic ceremony or working with a practitioner in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy? What are some keynotes on things to keep in mind in terms of PrEP and making sure that this person is regulated and has a, a sense of what regulation means. What's some tips for your end? That's an excellent question, Dr. Mason, and I wish more people were asking it. As you implied yourself, there's you know that need for the container and there's that need for regulation. I know that psychedelics are the new hot thing and sometimes people want to try the new hot thing, but the new hot thing isn't necessarily right for everyone. So there is a, a checking in with oneself to see, why do I want to do this? Is it curiosity? That might be a good enough reason, right? Is it healing? Okay. Where am I at? Where am I at in my life? Where am I at in my personal journey? Do I have a support system? If I go into the psychedelic space and discover something that might be challenging, what am I going to do with that? Are you in therapy weekly? Because if so, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to have that session next week and every session thereafter to help process whatever comes up. Even if it's a happy thing, how do I weave this happy thing into my life? Is your housing situation stable? Do you have friends? Are you safe physically? These sound like very basic things, but they're actually quite foundational. Because if you are going to make a shift in your consciousness, which is a shift in your life, potentially a shift in your perspective on life, you want to be safe and stable. When you do it, this can be very destabilizing work otherwise. And of course, we want to think about how someone is doing medically, how they're doing physically, how they're doing chemically. Are you in the process of switching your psych meds? Might not be a good time to start scrambling things up. Are you in the middle of a big move? Are you recovering from some major physical injury? There's no rush. I mean, mushrooms grow out of the ground. And MDMA, the longer you wait, the safer and more legal it's going to be to use it. Ketamine is already legal. DMT is still on toads that are hopping around in the Sonoran Desert. You know, just knowing the right place. If, is this the right time also? And then, of course, the setting. It's very important. So my first psychedelic experience was how to do it wrong. I was in Peru. I had just graduated from university. This was before psychedelics were really big. You know, I went to Peru and got the name of a shaman, sought out the shaman and was told, tell him you want to do San Pedro. I was like, okay, I want to do San Pedro. And I met the shaman and, you know, I just didn't like him. I didn't like the guy. And it wasn't uh, me being judgy. It was that uh, I didn't get a good feeling from him. Something felt off. And lo and behold, my first psychedelic experience was terrible. And it was well over a decade before I touched another psychedelic. And, you know, thankfully, I wasn't, I wasn't majorly traumatized by that experience, but it was a negative experience. It was not a healing journey for me at all. And so part of that is now, I know it's important to assess who you're with. Are you with people who you trust? Are you with people who are going to be able to hold you physically or metaphorically if things get messy with you? Are you in a setting in which you feel safe? I know a lot of people like to experiment with psychedelics. They'll take acid, which is LSD or psilocybin for the first time at a music festival. You're really rolling the dice on that one. That is a big environment with a lot of noise, a lot of energy, a lot of different people. You've got to stand in line to go to the bathroom. The bathroom's a porta potty. If you want peace and quiet, that might be hard to get, right? So the setting is important. Do you feel like you're more or less held in that setting? And are you with people you trust? Super, super important. Do you know what you're taking? 
Are you sure it's what you think it is? So I'm going to make a plug here for dancesafe.org. They sell drug testing kits on their website. Buy a testing kit. It's worth the money. Know what you're taking. There's also drugdata.org where you can actually mail a small amount of the substance to them. And using mass spectrometry, they will tell you exactly what is in that sample that you sent them. Whereas the drug testing kits just tell you what it isn't, the spectrometry will tell you exactly what it is. So know what you're taking. Understand the dose ranges. If it's your first time taking LSD, 250 micrograms is probably too much. You might start with 50. And if that goes well, take a little more. Having good information going into the experience is really important. One of the ways in which people develop the ability to ground themselves is through having these experiences, of course, but it's also important to have some tools going in. When stuff gets hard, what do you do instead of freaking out? Do you have some tools for that? Do you have some resources for that? Is there a grounding meditation you like to do? Is there an object you even may, might want to take with you, like a stone or a, a necklace that means a lot to you? And I know I'm painting this as, as a psychedelic journey being potentially harrowing. It isn't. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes it does need to be, but it doesn't always have to be. Sometimes it's very peaceful. And so people listening might then go have a psychedelic experience and say, what was she talking about? These are all insurance policies. And knowing that, that if things get hard, it's probably because they need to. And because the layer that needs to be healed, this is how it needs to get healed. And, and trusting in that. I have a free video online. It's kind of a crash course on how to trip and trip sit for other people. It's just the basics. That could be a good resource for folks as well. So I'll send you the link for that. We can add it to the show notes if you want. Shortly and briefly, what is integration and why is that important? So integration means reflecting on the experience, accessing and claiming the gold of the experience for yourself and weaving it into your life. And also responding to and reflecting upon what was challenging about the experience and finding the gold and the silver in that and working with that. It's essentially taking the information you received and doing something with it. So just to use an example for those in the medical world, I go to a lot of conferences and sometimes I get a, a note packet. I get a binder with all of the the notes from the speakers and all the talks I attended. And then I come home and I throw the note packet on a shelf and then 10 years goes by and I find it when I decide to buy a new bookshelf and I clean out the bookshelf. That's not integration. Integration is I take that note packet home, I put it on my desk and I open it up and I reread those notes and I start incorporating them into my work the next day or the next week. And I do it and I work it until that information is mine and I own it. It's a very different relationship. And so that's an analogy for how we can treat our psychedelic experiences. Integration does not have to mean going to see a therapist every week. It can, but it doesn't have to. There are other ways to integrate as well. Talking about psilocybin and mushrooms, from a more left-brain analytical perspective, you mentioned that um, they're very safe and they have a very high safety profile. What else is going on there from a very mechanistic point of view based on the research, based on traditional knowledge, based on just the available information we have? So far, science has yet to find a lethal dose of psilocybin, so that's reassuring. We don't really have any evidence of psilocybin being physiologically addictive, which is also reassuring. In terms of how psilocybin works, I can literally talk for two hours on that topic, and I do at conferences. So I'll mention that I also have an online course called The Science of Psychedelics. So if you visit scienceofpsychedelics.com, I have an entire module on the mechanisms of action of LSD and psilocybin. Kind of the quick and, and dirty or, or a few punch points of it are psilocybin lets your brain work differently for a period of a few hours. One of the ways in which it lets your brain work differently is it relaxes or turns down the volume on something called the default mode network or the DMN. And the DMN is sort of that background noise, that background script that your brain runs. And by the way, it can be a lie that it's running. But as it plays over and over again, it becomes rigid and you start to believe it and you start to be it. And evidence suggests that individuals who have depression, anxiety, addictions, obsessive compulsive disorder, and eating disorder have a very tight and rigid and strong default mode network. Now what psilocybin seems to do is turn down the volume on that and allow other messages 
to start circulating through the brain, other parts of the brain to talk that don't normally get heard, other parts of the brain talk to different regions of the brain that don't normally get to communicate. This is called crosstalk. This may be where some of the visuals come in because parts of the brain get to talk to the visual cortex. But this is also where we have our aha moments. This is also where we get to think about things from different angles. Wait a minute. I've been walking around my whole life with the story that I'm alone. But remember that amazing teacher I had in first grade who really got me? And remember how she's the one that introduced me to art? Yeah, and then art is what opened me up to meeting all these other people who are my friends. I've never been alone. You know, these realizations like this, even once the drug wears off, that realization stays with you. And this new information, wait a minute, I'm not alone and I've never been alone. You carry that with you into your life. That changes things. And yes, that was engendered by a change in a temporary change in your brain chemistry and your neurological firing. Absolutely. But the insight you gained in that space, that stays with you after the drug is metabolized. And so that's why, again, we really want to harp on having the situation be ideal because then you can really mine the data and get the gold from the experience. You can really allow it to wash over you and give it what you need. So there's a lot more I could go on, but quick and dirty. Actually, I'll say one more thing. Part of how LSD, psilocybin, and other classic psychedelics, as we call them, part of how they're different from conventional SSRI medications, by the way, SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. Those are drugs like Prozac and Lexapro and yada yada. Is the SSRIs affect serotonin through a receptor known as the 5-HT1A? 5-HT1A is what helps you cope with things. It helps you put up with what is hard. It blunts your reaction to the difficult stuff. Classic psychedelics like psilocybin, on the other hand, they act on the 5-HT2A receptor. And what stimulation of the 2A receptor does, it also helps you, but almost in the opposite way. It's not a sit there and grin and bear it response. It's a adapt and change response. It's a grow, it's a learn, it's an unlearn. So let's say you're walking around with a rock in your shoe and your foot hurts. What an SSRI medication does is it helps you live with that rock in your shoe without the discomfort in your foot pulling all of your attention. What psilocybin does is it makes you stop, sit down, take off the shoe, dump the rock, put the shoe back on. It's an at adaptability, it's a change oriented behavior as opposed to a tolerance behavior. Both are important. We need both for different stations in life. Sometimes we need both at the same time. They do not work the same way. And that's why I have been advocating for and sticking my neck out <laughs> in terms of uh, various advocacy efforts to get psilocybin understood by the medical community. Because once you understand it, how can you not want this for your patients and for yourself? And what we found in Oregon is people who were opposing our ballot measure to get psilocybin services legalized, once they were actually informed, they tended to switch their minds and support it. Dr. Erica, you have your Science of Psychedelics course available for practitioners online. It's an accredited course for continuing education with, with lots of good information. Do you want to talk about this resource that you put together? Sure, I would love to. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'll say I'd love to offer our listeners today a, a discount on the course. So Dr. Mason, I just need you to tell me what you want your coupon code to be, and we'll get that set up for, for folks tuning in. So the course was actually first, it was first created as an in-person course. So I was approached by a psychological association in Oregon. They said, hey, we would like for you to come teach a course to our providers who are mostly psychologists, some psychiatrists, some therapists on psychedelics. This is, we're getting a lot of questions about this. And I said, great. What are we, what are we talking, like an, an hour, hour and a half? They said, how about a whole day? Seven to eight hours. Okay, I can easily do that. This was in the month of December that I was slotted to speak. December in the United States is a bad month for planning events because People have the holiday season, vacations, it's the end of the calendar year. It's a hard time to get folks to take a day off 
from work and sit in an amphitheater in a hospital to do continuing education. So the organizers of the event said, you know, we'll be happy if we get like 35, 40 people sign up, like that'll be a success. I think there was something like 120 seats in the amphitheater. We sold out. It was the first time they'd ever sold out an event in the month of December. And I want to say it's because they all came to see me. Nobody knew who I was. They came because they were interested in this topic. This was before the pandemic. And so that then got broken up into shorter presentations that I gave at conferences. And then when the pandemic hit, I realized, well, people actually really need this information now because a lot of people are just trying psychedelics at home now because they're getting depressed because this is a scary, intense time. The world keeps turning. So I said, okay, well, it's time to take this, this show on the road. And by the road, I mean online. So I turned my day-long training into an online course. It's broken up into modules to make it more digestible, and they can be done in any order. There's a whole module on just the mechanisms of action on how psilocybin and LSD work on the brain. There's a module on using psychedelics to treat addictions. And yes, I look at psilocybin and LSD. We also talk about ayahuasca and ibogaine in that module. There's a module on MDMA for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and in couples work. There's a module on microdosing. There's a module on ketamine for depression and mood disorders. There's a module on sort of like, it's definitely not a certification program to become a psychedelic therapist, but it's like a crash course in like the minimum competencies you need to know. And then we have an experiential model where, no, I don't mail you LSD, but I talk, I talk you through a guided reflection process, a meditation, and then we have a curated music playlist where... The participants actually listen to the playlist with their eyes covered, wearing headphones. And that module is really there to teach the importance of the setting and how influential music can be in that process. People really underestimate how important music can be in facilitating a psychedelic journey. And I've had some clients say, you know, I don't want to listen to music because it's isn't that a distraction? And it's like, no, it's not. It's like wind in the sails. It really helps the psychedelic experience go deeper and unfold. We leverage those skills and those, those resources uh, in that module as well. The course can be just purchased a la carte. You can just do one module or two. The whole course, all eight hours, uh, are approved for eight hours of continuing medical education for physicians, as well as continuing education for psychologists, therapists, nurses, and, and various other types of practitioners. I really made the course with practitioners in mind because patients have questions about these medicines. And it's time that doctors stopped looking stupid when their patients ask them about these substances. But I explain things in a foundational way and in order with lots of diagrams in a way, you don't need any medical training or any clinical experience whatsoever to follow the course and glean something from it. So it's open to all, anyone who wants to take it as well. Great. Thanks for sharing your insight there on your course and how to access it. We'll put all the notes in the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Erica, for joining us for this Mason's Medicinal interview. And we just wanted to thank you so much for putting the time and effort into helping folks out in this arena and this avenue because it's well needed, like you said. Is there anything you'd like to share just before you leave about the importance of this work or something that you'd just like to share? Well, I'd like to end with some food for thought. The way that a lobster knows that it's time to grow. Yes, I'm talking about lobsters. <laughs> Lobster lives in a hard shell, right? Kind of like a hermit crab, except it makes its own hard shell. And it makes that shell to fit itself. And as the lobster grows, it outgrows its shell. And the way that the lobster knows that it's time to get a bigger shell is that it hurts. As the lobster gets bigger and presses against the walls of that too small shell, it's not comfortable. So then the lobster gets the cue and it goes and hides under some rocks where it's safe, and it sheds its shell that doesn't fit it anymore. And that lobster is a raw, vulnerable, and not very beautiful thing. And it sets about the work of creating a bigger shell for itself. And then once that process has been done, the lobster swims out from under the rocks and goes back to life as a bigger, 
stronger, healthier, more comfortable, more confident creature. And so whatever that process looks like for you, dear listener, I want you to know that I'm celebrating it and that I'm cheering you on and that at times it might not be the most graceful or comfortable thing, whether that includes psychedelics or not. You'll know if you're feeling called. You'll know when it's time to grow. You'll know when it's time to heal. And if something comes up, it's because it's ready to get healed. And there are many paths to do that. And psychedelics are just one. Thank you. Awesome analogy. Thank you.